This podcast is brought to you by Virtual Not Distant, where we help managers and teams transition to an office optional approach. Find out everything we do over at virtualnotdistant.com and check out our show notes and pictures of our lovely guests over on the podcast page. It's great to have you here, listeners. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to episode 266, where we are mainly going to talk about creating the space for social connection in organizations in the online space about uh, at both the team and organizational level, and but also what this really means. What does the social connection mean? Because we've, we're, yeah, because there's lots to say about it, but <laughs> I was already starting to think about it. But we also have a short what's going on section before that to share some of the things that are going on in the world of education, just some, some of our, our thoughts recently um, due to some experiences. So uh, Maya, when I say we, I mean Maya Middlemiss and myself. Hello, Maya. Hello, Pilar. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and my name is Pilar Orti, and we are in virtual, not distant space. So before we go into the meat of the episode, let's catch up with what's going on. Maya, I was really delighted to be part of PA 2021, which is the annual event by Project Access International. Have you heard of them? I hadn't heard of them before. No, it sounds really interesting. Yes, they they actually approached me through the website and they they are an organization, a not-for-profit uh, based in the UK, but operating internationally now who help uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds apply to top universities. And they do this through mentoring, so through some training. And this was their annual thing that they, that they do to get people together. And of course, they did it online. And they invited me on a panel to talk about the future of work. <laughs> what else? <laughs> yes. Uh, and of course, the first uh, question on the panel was, uh, what does the future of work say to you or mean to you and of course we went off on one uh, which it's such a great conversation because as soon as you start to really think of that you start to think well the future of work well it's also for future of education because mm -hmm. without knowing where people are coming from how can we design uh, and and it's it's about so many things so um so it was really interesting panel and Bernie Mitchell was there, who's been on the show before. Uh, he's, uh, for me, one of the people who embodies the spirit of co-working. Uh, he's doing other stuff also now. And also Nicholas Hopman, who is a co-founder of Human Aid. And mm -hmm. Human Aid is a platform and community where they, they've been set up to launch immediate fundraising campaigns for disasters. So a disaster happens and through their network and by doing it online they can launch a big fundraising campaign and i think the the one they did last year uh, was covid covid africa so we'll stick the links in the show notes mm. uh, and it's it's just really interesting they recruit throughout the year they build a team and then when the sorry they they build a team from their database when disaster happens so completely obviously completely distributed organization so that was that was also interesting um, stop me, Maya, if you have any questions, I'm just rat rattling through. No, because this is we haven't managed to catch up very much in the last couple of weeks. So, yes. you know, this is the only time we speak to each other when we stick the mics on. <laughs> <That's and laughs> true. I know, I know. Uh, we're, we're so async in this company. Um, so, yeah, so that's so we, we that panel. I love I love being part of panels because mm -hmm. uh, it well it's it's a bit like podcasting really. Yeah. Uh, they then so this was hosted in Hopin, which uh, which is a, a good platform for these kind of things. So we had the panel. Then they had a career fair. So I didn't go in, but I imagine they had different people in different breakout sessions in different sessions. I think they're called in Hopin, and people could go and and talk to whoever was uh, running those sessions about, yeah, about uh, career career advice, I imagine. And then they had, uh, which I thought would be of interest to listeners also, they had an education panel. So we had future of work and then future of education. 
And there was some really interesting stuff there. Um, this was mainly about education in universities. And there was someone talking about how augmented reality and virtual reality is already in those early stages wow. being incorporated. Yes. Exciting. Um, yeah, I never thought of that. Um, for mm. example, online environments to recreate physical labs or bodies for medicine. So I suppose like uh, virtual reality, you can actually stick <laughs> your, well, your thing. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need a 3D experience, I guess, for surgery or something. Yeah, <laughs> I, it, I, it, I never thought of this. You always get mm. so like... Uh, Uh, caught up in, um, in in how it can be used in conferences and stuff like that. But actually, it's got such an educational value, um, but we forget. Um, so I that was amazing. So that was, uh, that was one of the things. That, but then we did get into the more uh, wider uh, things like, oh, actually, no, because you have, you have something to say that is not as broad. So yeah, so sorry, sorry, listeners. So, yeah, so they also, of course, we're talking about just online lectures and how education has adapted to the, the year of COVID. And something that I thought was really interesting that might also be of interest to listeners is they were talking about one of the, um, the people on the panel was talking about how he'd found out that students preferred lectures to be recorded rather than live mm. because they could go back. You know, that kind of yeah. thing, even when you're concentrating, your mind always wanders off, or, or at least mine does. And suddenly it's like, oh, what did they just say? And yeah. if you've got it recorded, you can go back. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, but I think there's obviously some kind of more blended approach is going to have to come out of this overall for online learning, because we know that MOOCs don't work. They've been pre-recorded lectures around online for years with something like, what, 4% completion rate. So things are changing so fast. And what's so interesting is we've had this experiment where the whole world has learned online for a year and figured out what works or what doesn't work and which students succeed and which don't. You know, I think there are different learning styles that have been engaged better than others. And this is going to sort of roll through all the stages of education. And it will be so interesting to see what universities look like in five or 10 years. But I don't think we'll go back. No, and, and what this person was saying also is uh, going to your point that the lectures were delivered, they, they were preferred to be recorded, but the tutorials mm -hmm. are then where they're real, yes. suppose they're real learning and all the questions and everything like that. So I think in, in parallel with the world of work is those things when we're going to be, if we are meeting or gathering together to share hardcore information, well, can that be presented in advance in a recorded format so people can go through it in their own time, etc. Mm. Even if it's not written, even if it's just presented, it can be recorded and then use the time together to digest the material, ask questions or whatever, which which yeah. is still not being done. Um, and it's well, about Maybe education's better than work. I think they might be ahead of work <laughs> in terms of this idea of a flipped classroom and you present the material to be studied in a pre-recorded way and then come together for a live synchronous tutorial. Yeah. Um, maybe that's the way work should be looking at academia. And what someone else on the panel was saying about the another benefit of online is, of course, the diversity of nationalities. Mm. I think she was uh, studying uh, at Harvard online and she was saying, well, there's no way we would have had this diversity if everyone had had to go and live on right. campus. Yeah, and spend $50,000 dollars a year or <laughs> yes because the living costs as well they're they're, yeah. they're huge as well so and I was talking the other day to uh, Morgan Legg who was uh, one of the panelists in last in the last uh, mm. scheduled show on the learning culture and I was talking to her the other day and she was saying very similar thing she'd attended an online version of something that would have traditionally been de delivered in person and one of her points of feedback was this experience was so much richer for being able to have people from anywhere, not just the people yeah. who could get to the training room. So I think that we can really name that as one benefit. It doesn't mean that we always want to, like always, always want to do it uh, online, but I think that we can name that benefit as, yeah, that, that location independence also for the uh, classroom-based learning experience. Definitely. And I know that there's precedent in this from when some 
of the big American universities first started doing online courses a few years ago, like Stanford put a computer science degree online. And I think I think this might be apocryphal, so I'm not going to say it's gospel truth, but I, I read something that Google hired the entire cohort from India who completed that course in the first year because they, they thought, you know, people can find this and do it online by themselves in a completely unsuitable environment without any of the campus support that the cohort who are present are getting in terms of tutorials and so on, that, you know, it just makes amazing opportunities available to people who never would have had them. And it, it that kind of diversity approach is such a win-win because it means that big corporations can hire people they'd never reach normally, um, who in turn have access to life opportunities, which they wouldn't have got within a million miles of. So it is really exciting when you take the location out of it and it levels the playing field a lot. So listeners, if you know whether that is an anecdote, whether it's true or <laughs> yeah, not, tell me if us, that's true or not. Let us, my bubble <laughs> let us know. But even if it's not, you know, it would be quite, a, it's a nice urban myth. It, it is a mm. nice utopia also, if it's not true, which it, it could be. So virtualnotdistant.com <laughs> or tweet us at virtual teamwork with a zero instead of an O and let us know. Now you had also um, an article, Maya, something that you'd been looking at about what, what some of the uh, challenges have been during uh, 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 online learning. Was it online yeah. learning? Yes. Yes. And this was younger children, you know, sort of school age, because um, obviously we've just been through this year now. I think the UK is literally just coming out of it and children getting back into the classroom. But I think a lot of teachers around the world have had the experience of having to grapple with unfamiliar technology. And often that the kids are a little bit more savvy with it than they are. And of course, if the children don't want to learn, it's it's different with adults at university yes. who are adults and they're self-directed learners and they're paying a lot to be there, whatever. But it's it's different when it's kids in high school who'd rather not. And obviously, there have been problems around the world with this and people have found interesting ways of addressing it. And one of the people I spoke to last year, and we'll pop this link into the show notes, they managed to come up with a very simple idea of using single sign-on and individualized links for learning classrooms because otherwise kids would insist that they were in the lesson when they weren't, mm. <laughs> they weren't logged in at all so just being able to track that via an individual link I mean I've read all sorts of things about kids who've sent a sort of moving video loop of themselves oh. nodding attentively <laughs> oh. a kid who changed his name to connecting to audio dot 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 wow. um, so, the, so the teacher would never ask him a question <gasps> Wow. Um, you know, kids are so way out ahead of this compared to their teachers in so many cases. The only experience I had with educating a teenager in how to use Zoom was that I then went into a meeting myself on my own Zoom account with the username I am Pooh. Oh, yes, um, <laughs> So I guess I got off lightly and I have got a reasonably um, self-directed, motivated young learner compared to some kids have clearly gone to great creative lengths to get out of learning. But it's interesting how the technology is catching up with them. And again, all these are ripples which will cascade through both higher education and the world of work as this generation joins the workforce. So this is how they've learned this. They've learned what works and what doesn't in collaborating over distance. And I hope that stuff like that, you know, if, if kids do that, if they manage to create a loop or stuff, I I hope that, okay, once that they've been told that probably they don't want to do that if they want to be to live in society. But all, mm. I also hope that they get rewarded in some yeah. way. <laughs> because I can just see like, I can, I can just see it by, by someone having done that. And instead of saying, wow, you've got a real talent for that. And then saying to the parents, hey, your kid has a real talent for that. Keep an eye out to find opportunities. Yeah. With you know what? That was much harder than the maths homework. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but so I hope that you know that that part of this also the mindset change is so important. Yeah. Um, one of the, the so the final thing uh, around this that I wanted to share is that actually, um, the uh, la, 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 uh, sorry, I can't find my notes. Where was this? Oh, yeah. So, so finally, one of the the conclusions of the panel was that yes, in person and well, that I took from the panel was that in person and online will coexist. Mm -hmm. So there, there is, I think, it, we were already starting to play with the online space, and now, like you were saying, people have seen that actually there are 
times when having an online component is better and doesn't reduce the quality of the learning experience if we uh, think uh, use it right um, that they it will be co-located uh, sorry it will coexist but however the reputation of in person and in, of prestigious universities will probably still carry more weight for for yes. the near future um, but it, this also made me think that if you can study on so 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 when you go to university in 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 person or or how it's been traditionally one of the things that you do in university is you build your network which then helps you find work also one mm-hmm. of the things and i'm always thinking if you go abroad to study as is happening if you're really if you are uh, if you're lucky and can do that you build it's almost like you spend a few years there and that's the network you're building and then you return to your country and you have to start again if you yeah. are working if you're studying abroad but online you can carry on nurturing your you can start building your network in the place where you're going to end up working um while still yeah. studying so i think that's another thing another aspect i hadn't thought of Definitely. It's going to just blur all these boundaries. And we need to remember that when we're talking, you know, a little bit further down the line in terms of time and the way the technologies are converging, there's going to be so much less distinction between online and offline anyway, like you were saying at the top about sort of virtual reality and, you know, we'll have holograms to practice surgery on or whatever, that there's going to be much more blending, I think, that won't depend on physical location. And we'll probably be able to do that socially as well and for the networking side of things we'll just be building location independent networks from day one and it won't matter where we study live or work none of those things will be bounded by geography yeah so all of that to look out for and mm. we, we only cover the positive sides of all of this in the podcast listeners uh, you can you can think about what all the um the the challenges around this might be but i think yeah i hadn't until until I stopped and just listened to this conference, this all, I actually felt a bit out of touch, actually, with what was going on in in higher education, at least. Yeah. Well, we usually talk about the work side of things, yes. but I suppose we should remember that the kids who are in school now and the students in the university now, they will be coming into work with all of this experience and expectation over the next few years. So they'll be bringing that experience of having learned during lockdown and studied online um, into the workplace with very different expectations. Yeah. And also I think it's uh, because it does come up sometimes in conversations in the workshops uh, about how younger people are going to be able to work better with like, all the collaboration tools and stuff. And I think that th- there's both sides to that. One is that um Young people are comfortable with more comfortable with technology. Of course, they're di- some of them are digital natives. However, how we use stuff at work, it's still about how we communicate at work. There is still the stuff that goes around how I communicate with you at work is probably different to how, how I was in school, how I'm with my friends. So again, there's there's still that onboarding into the world of work, mm-hmm. even if they're gonna be faster to adapt to the technology. Uh, so it's yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's wonderfully uh, complex. I love it, love it. Um, so one more thing around uh, education, and this is actually now uh, uh, adult education. I've been working with B Next, who are part of People Matters India, and B Next is um, it's a series of uh, online based courses, but they use also a platform where you can have asynchronous discussions and there's a masterclass per course, etc. Uh, the course that I've been involved in with uh, is Virtual Leader and it's for HR uh, practitioners. And they, they're they calling it, calling it, and I love it, the cohort based learning, which is all about the strength of the learning experience is on that cohort. Mm. And for me, that is, again, the best use of the online space, because if you have to be together to be learning and feeding off each other in the same physical space at the same time, that limits, it just limits the experience. Not not just even if you live in the same city, you still have to be in a certain place at a certain time. And then bringing it online and saying, OK, for four weeks, you're with these people. And the idea is that we give you uh, 
bits of material you can reflect on. We ask you great questions. You share those questions. You comment on other people's questions. And in this cohort, you have an asynchronous experience, but also then a real-time experience where we then get you in a place where you can actually have real-time conversations. Uh, and I just think it's... I hadn't heard of the term, but of course it makes sense, the cohort-based learning. And I, yeah, I really love it. Yeah, it's it's great. It's like the idea of a tutorial group, isn't it? Extended out into mm -hmm. the real world. And the idea that when you've got the whole world to work with, you could actually put people together in groups where they are on the same path in terms of their education goals or their time frames or whatever. And it is part of that network building as well that we were talking about in higher education that you know, people learn alongside one another, that will be quite a formative experience and they'll they'll support each other both during the process and potentially afterwards. Yeah. So that's yeah, so this is this is the update around uh, education, which the future of education, I suppose. I don't know what's going on in education now. And it's already starting to highlight the the topic, the main topic of the episode, which is this uh, socialization in the online space. So already we can see this cohort-based learning has a very strong element of that, of we are working in a group, we're working by being social, we're working by communicating backwards and forwards with each other. And we've seen that this is an aspect that for those organizations, for those people moving from being in the office together to then having to be working from home, the socialization aspect has been one of the things that has disappeared at the beginning uh, and mm -hmm. that people miss more often. So um, I thought we could spend a bit of time talking about what that might mean, because the um, let, let's have a bit of music to segue us into the main topic. And actually, I didn't real, realize that segue was spelled S-E-G-U-E. Uh, I, I learned that the other day. But anyway, let, let's have a bit of music to segue us into that. So now that we've had the music to uh, to stop my rambling, <laughs> uh, yeah. So my uh, my my thing is that uh, when when teams have looked at okay, how do we or, or even organisations, how do we uh, continue to provide a space for that social element of working together that is so important? The conversation seems to be going immediately to just being social, as in just non work related interactions. And I'm beginning to get a bit concerned. And the reason, the reason for it is, although they are really important and they, there's the thing that uh, we're missing most, like a virtual coffee. We're great fans of people having virtual coffees when you meet up and just uh, talk about non-work stuff. For me, that is starting to be the equivalent of saying that the main way of being social when we work in a building together is by going to the pub afterwards. Mm -hmm. to the bar like it's one aspect but that aspect is being given a lot more visibility and importance than other aspects yes I agree completely and I think it's was kind of a thing that a lot of organizations have probably struggled with over the past 12 months because they didn't know how to do it they realized it was important to somehow replicate the sociability of being in the office space but Unfortunately, what a lot of people ended up with was another meeting, which, mm. you know, just because it's after work and you're supposed to have a glass of wine or do something together that's not work, it's it's still another commitment, another synchronous encounter when you've probably been on online all day. Um, and it also can very easily then shift to sending the message that you're not supposed to have social interactions during the working day or outside of those special times that we have for it. And that doesn't happen in the co-located workspace. If you're going for a drink after work, it doesn't mean that you won't exchange pleasantries on personal information or points of social connection through the day. But once you put it into the online space where all communication has to be intentional, it's a real risk that when you kind of put things in boxes like this, that it shuts down other other possibilities and moments where you could really connect. Yeah, so it's, um, uh, listeners, we're not saying that the virtual coffees don't have their space or or even the the the, the meeting that uh, Maya was referring to. But what we're seeing is the 
very uh, specific focus uh, on that kind of activity. And, and less so finding the opportunities where people are social during the workday, which are not about just unwinding and, and, and leaving work behind. Because I think, well, it goes back to, <laughs> I don't know, Maya, but I'm always projecting myself onto everything. But for me, it's such an effort to <laughs> talk to my work colleagues about non-work related stuff, uh, unless I know them very well and then it's just spontaneous. But I love talking about work. And, <laughs> and talking about, it might not be about the task I'm doing, but talking about what I'm learning or what's going on in the industry or what I'm hearing someone else is doing or finding out more about what someone is doing. That for me is the point of connection. And that's the social point. Uh, and, and so what I'm, what I'm thinking is just to make sure that we are providing the space for those conversations also, and that yes. that is all right. Yeah, I, I think there's so much that can be done in terms of how we use the tools that we've got for both synchronous and asynchronous communication to encourage those kind of threads of, of idea sharing and making them optional because nobody should feel obliged to do social things. You know, we have to collaborate and communicate about the work that we're working on together. But if there is space around that to weave in little points of interest or to explore ideas or to ask questions and reflect on things. I mean, this is a, a good, another segue from last week's learning panel mm -hmm. in the previous episode about how, um, you know, organizations manage to share things that they've learned. It's often by these little conversations that aren't directly related to the work that we're presently engaged on, but more, this was interesting, or that made me think about that or want to ask you about the other and there has to be room to breathe in all of our online conversations for those little nuggets to happen and grow into sometimes really brilliant, serendipitous things that never would have happened otherwise. Yeah. And also maybe to create the space for that. And, and, and when I say create the space, what I mean is to name them and to say that mm. they're important. So again, those conversations, not to miss them, not to miss them out completely or to create the space for them either in, in another, in a bit of a meeting just to say, okay, well, we've got, we, we're going to cover agenda for 20 minutes and then we've got 10 minutes for whatever emerges yeah. or, even, okay, we're going to have those kind of conversations asynchronously just to make sure that we can have the conversation because for whatever reason, we don't want to have them synchronously or we can't. But it's all these, uh, we're connecting, socialization for me is connecting with other humans at a personal level, so a more emotional level. And that connection can happen both throughout work-related conversations in whatever aspect and in the non-related conversations. Mm. So it's it, of course it's of course it's easier and more straightforward to find the space for the non-work because we know what that looks like. That looks like we're not talking about work and we're just sharing stuff. So that's so that's easy to to make the space for. And then we can think a little bit deeper about what else, what other conversations and interactions are we missing that we're not getting through the day-to-day -day more task-focused uh, conversations? Yes, and that those are the things that, say, they make life work living. They make being in a team mm. more interesting and rich. And those are the things that I'm sure, you know, reading lots of, sort of mass media articles about working from home, those are the things that have got overlooked often in the rush to remote for business continuity because they are seen as softer or you know less of an urgent thing to prioritize or maybe people just didn't know that they were missing or that they had to be cultivated intentionally when you you're working in a distributed way and i think a lot of organizations will benefit from really thinking about that thinking about what they miss and how to weave that back into their everyday Yes, because when you're co-located, these things happen, but you don't realize it also. Mm. They they can happen spontaneously. But as we've said in the online space, it's really difficult for anything to be spontaneous. So it can feel strange to have to put time aside or a tool aside to bring out this kind of information. But the online space works like that. So yeah. I think, yeah, that's that's why it's it's really difficult. And unless you've either experienced it in that way or you 
have the time and headspace, which not many people have had, to stop and think about, okay, what are we? Re- what do we really mean by we miss the social side? What do we really yeah. mean? And then start to unpick all the different aspects of this that then you can start to design something that you do need to have a bit of everything uh, in the team yeah. uh, because of that diversity. And it needs, ju- yeah, just that intentionality. It needs resourcing. It needs some somebody to talk about who's responsible for it. If we're all responsible for it, is somebody going to take the lead on this? I remember your um, interview with Chris Colodonato recently, and it was clear a huge part of her job was really stimulating those human connections within the organisation that she worked in. And that's a role that would never exist in a co-located building where all these people are just going to bump into each other anyway and form their own connections and relationships. And the place she worked had recognised that need and found the perfect person to take the initiative on that and really set an example. This is how we interact and connect with each other. And that's bound to ripple through the whole organisation, whereas lots of places, I'm sure, haven't reached that level of thinking yet of recognising that they need a Chris. (laughs) Yes, you all need a Chris. (laughs) (laughs) The clone her or something. (laughs) So if we look at, so uh, at an organizational level, it really is, um, it, th- I think that to start with, it's got to be the people who, who have the space to be thinking about this, or actually the people who have more contact with more people in the organization that can start to promote some of this or set up or encourage some of these systems, because they are. Um, if you talk about, for example, Trello's pairing system, where they pair someone, uh, one person in the organization with another person in the organization and get them together to just have a chat. Uh, so, and, and to talk about whatever is important to them at that moment and then share it with the rest of the organization through an update on, uh, mm. on, uh, that is visible to everyone. Um, and then, so at the organizational level, and we can do that through, uh, throughout by looking at, okay, what are the different interests? So is there, uh, can something be done around the organization where we get people together synchronously or asynchronously around some themes, topics, something that, yeah, whether they're hobbies or whether they're interesting things around the work that otherwise they wouldn't have the space to talk to. Um, yeah. And and things like Yammer, the social enterprise network, uh, because it's equated to social media, it's always like, oh, yeah, just another thing there. But actually, a little place where you can just have a look at what people are thinking and how people are talking to each other. And, and again, uh, ask questions that are related to your job, but that your team is not going to be interested in, but someone else in the organization might. I think those spaces are also undervalued sometimes. Yeah, I think I'm sure you're right. And particularly in larger organisations, I think there could be a real sense that you don't connect with anybody except your team. And you, you might vaguely know that you're part of this huge thing. But unless you have a specific reason to interact, then you probably wouldn't. So it's great if those things can be just structured a little bit to encourage it. And then the spontaneity will happen. It just needs kind of nudging in the right direction. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be that big. So you're talking about structuring. So if we go back to the team uh, level example, uh, in the same episode you're referring to on uh, creating a learning culture, Gonzalo Silva from Duist said how they, uh, I think it was, yeah, in the last week, at the end of the week, they're prompted to answer the question, what interesting thing have you learned in the last week at Duist? Mm. And how he's saying that how much people are participating in that. And I think that that question as the prompt of what interesting thing, it already prompts you to think, right, what what else? What else have I learned or or or, or whatever? Or and, and then sharing that can be a point of connection, just the sharing yeah. of some learning. And how somebody answers that will tell you so much mm. about them, about what they're working on, what they're interested in what they think other people will be interested in, you know, how they choose to reflect on that learning and whether they share it from a kind of benefits focus or a a work focus or a personal interest or whatever. It would just be really, really insightful to hear colleagues answer that. Maybe people you don't know all that well, you you've learned so much. And some people might get, like me, might get as much from that as from having a social chat. Yeah. So, And if you can just do that around your work conversation in the threaded chat, then you don't need to have you know, a virtual pasta making evening or whatever when everybody's tired and done well, you can have, already. <laughs> well, you can have the pasta making also, but you can make it also optional. 
Uh, yeah, and, exactly. and and so what you what you make sure is that the people who are going to enjoy the pasta making have that and the people who don't enjoy it and will turn up for the teammates because they're good teammates actually have something else but yes. that you don't <laughs> that you don't restrict it to the pasta making uh, uh, hobbyists mm-hmm. um, the the other one i like around this is uh, uh, um, Lilich oh, Johan Lilich's um, direct framework which we've got a whole episode around that but in talking about working out loud in his remote team, he said it's good to have uh, a sense of what we want to be telling our teammates that we're doing because we don't want to be uh, talking about everything we're doing. So working out loud is about communicating things that are of use to us or our teams. And he has the framework direct, which as a reminder is any decision you've made, any insight you've had, any um, results you've achieved, any emotions you've felt, any contacts you've made, any troubles you've had. And we added thanks, any thanks you want to give. And again, having a space, whether it's beginning of a meeting, end of a meeting, or in a Slack, or in a Google Doc, or in an email that circulates once a week, again, it's what are the things that we are not getting? What are the conversations mm. we're not having? What are the um, points of connection that have disappeared? And this could be one because all those things could be directly related to work, but they give you space to say a little bit more about yourself and to create another yeah. point of connection. Definitely. And for managers, that's, you know, that should be something that they're really grateful to have that that insight into what's going on with the individuals as well as around the work and even in how much or not is answered mm. <laughs> in the, and how people engage with this tells you a lot about what people are needing so so yes i think that, i mean there's lots of things we have uh, in virtual not distance a presence question which says when will you be around anything we should know uh, and that again is is another prompt it's, it's about the only prompt question we have in, in our little yeah, team. Well, we're a very tiny team yes. and we're all working on different things. Um, you know, Becky and I are very part time and it's just a really nice little kind of check in because um, what we answer that with often is what's important to me this week. Yes. As well as what's happening in the stuff I'm doing for virtual not distance. So it's just a nice little kind of way of connecting with the team at the beginning of the week. And it's automated. And this is the yeah. thing why if we have these tools to communicate and we need them to create stronger relationships online or even when we start, to, when people start to move back to the office also, the online space is going to be the common space for a very long time. Mm. Use technology to help you. So don't wait for people to have to remember to do something. Put a reminder <laughs> there. Um, yeah. it and makes that also makes difference. it structural as well. Yes. It makes it the responsibility of everybody instead of, oh, that's HR's job to ask those questions or something. Somebody has to remember to do it or what if they're late or they forget or so yeah. it just kind of when you make it part of the routine then it makes it just part of the the way we do things i always love uh what uh, i don't know if anyone said it before him but i've, I've always heard jurgen apollo say manage the system not the people or manage the mm. process which one is it <laughs> uh, and and it is about that is it, it is about what yeah. how can we use the online space just to create a set of uh processes, prompts, so that we don't lose the humanity. So I, yes. I know that for some people will be like, oh, this is getting really rigid. And But actually, it's because in the online space, unless you have a, a little bit more prompts and nudges, things just get lost. Yeah. Yeah. We need to, to nudge the systems along at all times. And yeah, like Jürgen said, get out of the way, then the people can do their thing um, yes. <laughs> within that space that you create. I don't want to lose from this conversation the part that co-working spaces can play in socialization, Mm -hmm. because this goes back to one of the very, very first uh, conversations around office optional with Chris Lemp about the fact that some people don't want to socialize uh, at work going back to how Mm. it used to be. (laughs) And actually, lots of people, you know, they're fine. Of course, they want to get on with colleagues and all of that. But actually, their main social needs are met outside of work. And this is one of the arguments for being able to work away from an office is that you can spend more time in your community. And so for those who are listening now who've experienced remote work only as working from home, and if you're in an organization that is going to look at how this might work in the future... Don't forget that you might have access to co-working spaces or that people might have access to co-working spaces. Yeah. And that yeah. can provide an element of socialization 
that they might not be getting at work. And, and that's one more way. Definitely. And it, it's it's not binary. You know, we keep talking about the return to work being hybrid. For some people, that's going to mean working in an office part of the time or coming in for particular meetings. And then some of it could mean at home, but it can also mean these third spaces. And I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of them springing up, whether they're formal co-workings or kind of repurposed hospitality venues and places offering kind of food and work or childcare and work or just more kind of spaces happening within the local community because the retail side of things is in such a bad shape yeah. in, in our, our local suburbs. But there's all this real estate on the high street that's going to need to be revitalized. And I'm sure we're going to see people working um, not necessarily at home, but not too far from home either. The the near home uh, concept that we might have already released the episode where Francisco talks <laughs> about it. I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping so, but and I think that that's really important to 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 just acknowledge that for some people their social needs are not were not being met at work before and now they're not going to be met at work either and but the the concept of being around other people and having access to other people might still be important and of course as always i think co-working spaces are great places to have your people because they interact with people outside of your organization and they hear different mm -hmm. stuff and they see different stuff and they have conversations that they would never have with people in your organization <laughs> um, especially if your organization has a strong culture actually so yeah and a lot of that is really going to benefit the organization yes. you know a lot of um places that probably would have worked in a much more co-located way in a different year like tech startups and things like that if you can't bring your people together for that buzz then you can at least put them alongside other people who were working in a similar mindset and they will gain from that undoubtedly so listeners it'd be great to hear how your team or even at an organization level is uh, is looking at this what is it how are you creating the space for the conversations that you're missing the interactions that you're missing that do not happen in the day to day how are you creating the the space for that uh, whether it's a virtual coffee because that's actually at the end of the day that's what we really need actually you know we we we, we know we we're fine about uh, talking about work we're doing that but actually what we're really missing is the virtual coffee and that's what we're focusing on or actually is it about conversations around what we're learning is it about conversations around the industry that we're really missing what is it so we'd love to hear pilar at virtualnotdistant.com or of course virtualnotdistant.com the contact form I do want to say, though, that on, on the back of this, Maya, the, the, this service that we're kind of launching, soft launching continuously um, of the in-house podcast, I think this is also a little way of uh, socialization asynchronously. And again, it's finding what are the conversations that people are missing in the organization that could be part of an audio episode. And that mm. could be things that people hear or even or even finding who's having conversations one to one or, or one to three or four that actually if they were having it in a canteen that they would gather more people around and finding that conversation, putting it on the internal podcast and then seeing how that conversation can grow. So there's again and whether you, it would be great if you did that with us we could help you but what are the other avenues for something like that as well where are the places yes, where... tell us about it yeah. if you're doing it maybe um i think these conversations are starting to happen on clubhouse now people are talking in sort of audio groups related to their work and it would be really interesting to explore that in a bit more depth in another episode as part of work mm yeah oh. seeing lots of professional groups coming a lot of them are sort of entrepreneurs and marketers and things like that but I've seen others that are, are closed conversations for pre-existing groups so I think there's going to be um, some interesting spontaneous stuff going on there that we'll have to dig into at some point excellent well if you're doing that in your organization let me yeah, know because <laughs> I would I would I would love to hear um, and if not just find traditional stuff that you've got how can you make that newsletter a bit more two-way what questions can you ask people how can you prompt people to contribute to that newsletter a bit more what is your intranet doing is it really being used to the full potential to just provide those little bits of interactions that we could define as social and, and using those as well, as well as in the team. We've had lots of ideas around that. So we'd love to hear 
You can also tell us on LinkedIn because we have uh, a LinkedIn page. And I just wanted to highlight that we have a question of the month. And I wanted to share, Maya, what people have been replying to uh, this month, to the question that was actually related to the panel. Um, so now that you're not working in an office together, how are you capturing the learning in your team that happens away from each other? Or if you're someone working on your own, what's your approach to development? And we've had some, uh, uh, well, I, I like the contribution. So uh, Bart said the social collaboration platform, be it Teams, Google Workspace or whatever, is the best place to log and share learning topics and learning tasks as well. This can mm -hmm. either be in the team project department team, where it can be integrated in day-to-day -day work or in a dedicated learning context. And I like that because that's that reminds me of the social conversation. It can be something that's yes. integrated or you can have a separate spot. Definitely. Well, none of these things are siloed, are they? Yeah. I mean, we're, we, we connect over what we learn because we're enthusiastic about it or it's intriguing or whatever. So it's it's all part of that whole big conversation. And I, I like the idea that some things are very topical and or project related, but other things are so general that really part of just the, the whole conversational flow. Yeah. So thank you, Bart. And uh, Subramaniam says, making things visible becomes critical when working virtual, often stacking individual learnings and sense-making outputs in a single asyn asynchronous platform makes it easy for all to relate. Following it up with a shooting the breeze session to reflect upon them helps sync up on the learnings even better. I, I love that as well, just having the two spaces and uh, strengthening and reinforcing and also just giving that uh, a space for the diversity of communication. So, yes, and diversity of learning styles. Yeah. Some of us are going to want to read something. Some of us hear something. Some of us need, need to, some of us might actually do our learning while we summarize it for someone else, yeah. and, you know, think about how to share it. So by having this diversity of, of tools and media available, that's how we can make the most of it for everyone. Yeah. So there's, so thank you very much for those contributions. Also, thank you to everyone who, uh, who contributed and commented on the, on, on my own personal post. Uh, well, it's not a personal post, but it was on my personal account on culture, which went down very mm. well, which we will keep talking about. And also, where are my notes? Where's my Trello? Go back. Oh, how can I go back? My Trello is stuck on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> You've broken it. Hang on a second. Because I did want to thank, um, I'm doing it from memory, Rachel, I think it was, who connected on LinkedIn. She said she worked, she listened to the podcast and she connected. So I just wanted to say hello to her. And I've got my notes and let me just double check. That my memory was okay. Yes, that's it. And also, so thank you, Rachel, for connecting. And also thank you, Pedro, because he shared in Spanish an update um, of, a, of one of the LinkedIn pages posts on visible teamwork. And he, he said it in Spanish. He said, La información sobre usted que otros recogen por osmosis en el espacio físico debe comunicarse con intención en el mundo en línea, which is the communication that others usually take by osmosis in the physical space needs to be deliberately communicated online. So thank you, Pedro, for amplifying <laughs> our work. Great. Good. So, Maya, anything else before I rattle off all the calls to action that we have? No, rattle away. Um, I think it's been a, a really interesting. It's quite nice to do a slightly more themed what's going on and, and really drill down into an important area that's quite evergreen and, and significant. So that's our first call to action to you listeners. If there's any area that you have something to say or that you would <laughs> like to hear us rattle about or uh, any, yes, just let us know because it always, it always helps to get some uh, input and also just to stimulate our own thinking. So virtualnotdistant.com if you want to uh, say hello you can sign up to our monthly newsletter there as well you can of course subscribe to this show on whatever podcast app you use especially if you came across us in uh, on social media or website you we are 21st century work life you can follow us on linkedin you can follow us on twitter virtual teamwork with a zero and you can email me pilar at virtualnotdistant.com listeners Thank you so much for listening. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast produced by Virtual Not Distant. 
If you have something to add to the conversation, let us know through the contact form over at virtualnotdistant.com. I have been your host, Pilar Ortiz, and I'm signing off now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.